So we've, we've established the fact that the typical membrane potential for a neuron is about negative 70 millivolts. Now this membrane potential can increase or decrease in response to temporary changes in membrane permeability. These changes in membrane permeability are going to be brought about by the opening or closing of what we call gated membrane channels. So let's talk about a couple of different types of channels that are present within our cell membrane. First we have what we call passive channels. These are non-gated channels. These are going to be channels that are always open. Some of the more common non-gated channels are what we call our potassium leak channels. And we'll see the significance of these potassium leak channels and how they confer an increased permeability of a membrane to potassium and the role that plays in our resting membrane potential. The other type of channels are what we call active channels. And these are what we, we use the term gated channels. And by gated, that means that this gate can either be opened or closed. And that can then affect the ability of these ions to move across the membrane. Some of the more common gated channels are what we call ligand gated. So this just simply means that a chemical of some type will cause this channel to open or close. So the ligand binds to a receptor and brings about a conformational change in that channel which causes it to open or close. There are mechanically gated channels. These are going to respond to physical forces such as stretch. An important group of channels that we'll talk about next lecture we call voltage gated channels. And these are channels that are going to open or close in response to changes in voltage. Let's look and see how changing the relative permeability will affect membrane potential. So in this case I am giving that the relative permeability for sodium and potassium are these numbers here. So potassium in this case is the most permeable ion so we say that it has a relative permeability of 75 percent. Sodium is 10 percent and then we'll plug in a ion X which has a relative permeability of 15 percent. So we're going to insert those into this equation. So again, we're going to use one of the major factors in the GHK equation, which is the relative permeability of the membrane to each of these ions. We then are going to plug in the equilibrium potential for each of these ions. Now we're going to do the math here, and if we add these together, we'll get a resting membrane potential of negative 72 millivolts. So that is the resting membrane potential for this cell. Let's change these relative permeabilities. How do we do that? We do that by opening or closing different channels. So let's say that we're going to make this cell membrane now more permeable to sodium. So we're going to do something which is going to open up sodium channels which will make the membrane much more permeable to sodium. So now we're going to increase the permeability to, of sodium to 75% and basically flip potassium down to a relative permeability of only 10 percent. Okay, this was achieved by simply increasing the permeability of the sodium by opening up channels which would allow sodium to move in. So now let's plug these numbers in. So this is now our new relative permeabilities. The equilibrium potentials stay the same because the concentrations of these ions is the same. And notice what happens now if we do the math. Now we're going to come up with a membrane potential of plus 27. So by changing the relative permeability of the membrane, we can see by understanding the golden hatchkins catch equation that this has dramatically changed the membrane potential of that cell. So when we talk about resting membrane potential, we say that we are going to be changing it based on whether or not we increase or decrease the permeability of the membrane to that ion. We'll sometimes see that ter a term used that we're changing the conductance of the membrane to a particular ion. So as the membrane is made more permeable to an ion, the membrane potential will move toward that ion's equilibrium potential. We saw that on the previous slide. So sodium's equilibrium potential is plus 60. So if we increase the sodium conductance or we increase the sodium permeability of the membrane, we would expect to see the resting membrane potential move toward sodium's equilibrium potential. 
So the green arrow indicates that we are uh, opening up sodium channels and that causes us to move toward sodium's equilibrium potential. Now if we have another chemical messenger, and in this case it's going to cause the permeability of the membrane to increase to potassium, then what we're going to see is that the membrane potential then is going to move toward potassium's equilibrium potential. We need some definitions as we're using these various terms, so let's make sure we're clear on those. At resting membrane potential, which is negative 70 in these typical cells we're discussing at this point, we, sell, we say that the cell is polarized. And what that indicates is that indicates that there's a separation of charge across the membrane. Changes from that polarized state, meaning changes from that baseline of negative 70, can be described in the following ways. Anytime we are less negative than minus 70, and I've highlighted that in this green area, so really that would go all the way up to the top, anywhere in that, situa in that area, the cell is said to be depolarized. If we do something to the cell and make it more negative than minus 70, then we say the cell is hyperpolarized. So those are kind of large umbrella terms that describe the depolarized state and the hyperpolarized state. And again, this depolarized state includes everything upwards. Now, since so some other terms that we're going to use that kind of fall within these categories, and this first term is called depolarization. So if we do something that makes us become depolarized, we say the cell is undergoing depolarization. If we then are going to return back to the polarized state, we call that repolarization. So notice that the cell itself is depolarized in this green area, but we're still undergoing repolarization as we're moving back toward our baseline state. We're going to see in some situations we become more negative than what we started, so we are hyperpolarized, and the way we become hyperpolarized is by hyperpolarization. So this would be perhaps, say, opening up a potassium channel, making our cell move toward potassium's equilibrium potential. So two types of signals have been classified as a result of this type of ion movement. Graded potential, which we'll talk about now, and then next we'll be talking about an action potential. So graded potential is a diffusion potential. So graded potentials result from ions moving through either a ligand-gated or mechanically-gated channel. There's other channels too that can also cause graded potentials, but these are going to be two main ones that we'll focus on for now. So these things are called graded potentials because they, magnet, they can vary in magnitude, meaning they can be small or they can be large. They can also vary in polarity, meaning they can be hyperpolarizing or depolarizing. So in this example, let's say that we've just opened up a ligand-gated sodium channel. That allows sodium to move in, sodium, so that's going to cause the cell to move towards sodium's equilibrium potential. So this is a depolarizing event. Sodium's moving down its electrochemical gradient. This is a graded potential. If we, cause a if we create a stimulus that causes an even greater increase in sodium permeability, then that means more sodium is going to move, which means we're going to have a stronger graded potential. So this is an example of different sizes of graded potential. If we have another stimulus that, say, rather than open up sodium channels, causes us to open up potassium channels. In this case, we are going to have a hyperpolarizing event. This is still a graded potential. So this is an excitatory stimulus. This is an inhibitory stimulus. These are different sizes. These are all graded potentials. So a stimulus that results in depolarization is excitatory. A stimulus that results in hyperpolarization is inhibitory. And what those are referencing is in regards to their ability to 
bring us closer to an action potential which we'll talk about in our next lecture. So when we initiate a graded potential on a cell membrane, those effects are going to occur right at the point that the stimulus occurs, but they're also going to have effects as that signal is conducted. Remember, this is an electrical type of signal. The thing with the graded potential is, is that the, graded, the strength of the graded potential weakens the further we get away from the site of origin. So imagine that this was a nerve and we had a stimulus here in the middle, and this is an excitatory stimulus. So closest to the stimulus, we'll see we're going to have the largest graded potential. But as we move down the neuron in different directions, we see that that graded potential becomes weaker. And the reason that's occurring is because, in essence, this is an electrical current, and it's leaking out of the neuron. It's losing its, its magnitude as it travels. This is called decremental conduction. So here's a basic neuron, and you need to go back and review your basic neuron anatomy from your freshman biology. I will assume you know that. But here we have cell body, the axon, and then the axon terminals. And it's on the cell body where we're going to have receptors. So imagine that this is a receptor, and we have a ligand that's going to come and bind to that receptor. In this case, I have it drawn in green, indicating that this is going to be an excitatory stimulus. So we have a ligand-gated channel that is now bound to that ligand, and that channel opens. That's going to allow the movement, say, of sodium into the cell. That then will result in an excitatory potential, as we've shown here at the top. Now, the thing about graded potentials is that they can be added together. So here we have the same type of neuron. We have excitatory receptors on the cell body. We have our ligand coming in. Remember that when we had one of these ligands bind, we got a small blip, a small graded potential. In this case, if we have two ligand-gated channels opening, that's going to allow more sodium in, and that's going to give us a stronger graded potential. So this is called summation. Now remember that graded potentials can be depolarizing or hyperpolarizing, and that depends on the channel that it opens. So here in red, we have a channel that's going to be an inhibitory channel. So this would be a channel that, when it binds to its ligand, might allow potassium movement. And potassium, because of its electrochemical gradient, is going to go out of the cell. So when potassium leaves the cell, it's going, to de it's going to hyperpolarize that cell, which is shown here by this negative curve. It's moving toward potassium's equilibrium potential. So realize that in our typical neuron, we may have lots of different synapses. A synapse is where one neuron touches another neuron. This is where we're going to have the release of our chemical messenger. And these are going to be acting upon receptors on the cell body of this neuron. So if this is a synapse, we would call this neuron the postsynaptic neuron. So in this case, we're showing the excitatory synapses in green and the inhibitory synapses in red. Now, each synapse always has the same chemical messenger, so it's always going to result in the same response. So if we were to stimulate excitatory synapse A, we would expect to see a small depolarization. Same with B. We would see a small depolarization. And C, because it's an inhibitory synapse, it's going to result in... Now if we added both A and B together, meaning we stimulated them both at the same time, we would then see the combined effects. We would see them summate. This is called any of these things. All three of these are called an EPSP, and that stands for an excitatory postsynaptic potential. So remember, we're measuring the cell membrane potential in this cell, and this is the postsynaptic cell body. So this is, these are excitatory postsynaptic potentials. If we stimulate C, this is going to result in a hyperpolarization. 
So this is called an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Now we can still summate excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. So in this case, if we stimulated A and C together, we would then take the net effect of those two together and that would result in no change. That is still called summation.